leaders of tomorrow. You're watching the 10th edition, 10 seasons of identifying champions, 10 seasons of recognizing excellence. I'm Sunanda Jai Seelin and on this 10th edition, we're going to continue championing your cause, that of the entrepreneur and bring you the most expert voices along your growth journey on tonight's show. First up, we have a macroeconomic voice, uh, someone who needs no introduction, Surjit Bhalla, Executive Director, IMF for India, joining us to talk all things macroeconomy and what more we should see as far as some specific sectors are concerned. We're also in conversation tonight with Namita Thapar, ED of MQ Pharmaceuticals. foremost, what sort of comprehensive changes do we need to see as far as manufacturing is concerned? Because uh, a majority of India's small businesses are involved in the manufacturing space and traditional manufacturing, especially. The government has given some sort of impetus uh, through the PLI scheme. But if that is going to be sustained, what's the kind of roadmap, perhaps, or the blueprint or the plan that you would like to see on the part of the government uh, for manufacturing? You know, the PLI is, a, I think, um, quite an important change. What we've seen now with the even the food subsidy program, which has been hugely successful during the pandemic, with the PLI, I think the government is becoming a lot more efficient in the delivery of services and delivery of policy. So I think the production linked incentives, while it started off as, oh my God, here we are, the government is intervening again, yep. may turn out to surprise us all. Um, and so I think that's a very significant beginning in terms of uh, or change in policy vis-a-vis -vis manufacturing. Um, in terms of, you know, manufacturing is in a declining trend around the world, but we have as you rightly said, our manufacturing sector is much lower than what it should be. And I would think from what I've seen on export growth, et cetera, that there is a, and some of that is services, but a lot of that is, is good in terms of the growth. So I think there is a, a structural change. I hope that it is a quite a significant structural change in terms of exports and also in terms of manufacturing. So all of these, you know, the PLI just started six months ago, a year ago, perhaps. And we'll have to wait and see. But right now, I'm not seeing any disconcerting data regarding the PLI. And I think further initiatives, the, I, my sense is that the government quite believes that the manufacturing sector should expand should have an increasing share. And I think now with the US-China war, uh, trade war, I, I think we stand to benefit from that. And, uh, you know, there is, as you uh, have noted, there's a considerably more foreign investment uh, in manufacturing in India. Uh, and I think this trend will continue. Speaking about manufacturing, I do also want to, and I would love to get your views as far as the services sectors in India are concerned, the touch and contact sectors, travel, tourism, hospitality, all of them had started seeing some bit of an uptick in demand at the end of the second wave, have been again impacted because of the third wave, you were speaking of the likelihood perhaps of, you know, fourth wave or at least a lingering impact really of the pandemic all of 2022. What do you think the government should do to provide some sort of real meaningful handholding, soft tax concessions, you know, whatever that might look like for these industries? Uh, if we are to ensure that uh, the, the, the worst really of the pandemic is being negated in that sense for these industries. I wouldn't say vis-a-vis -vis something specifically with the services sector, but you're absolutely right that the services sector yeah. has been most of your hit by the pandemic. And again, we'll have to, uh, what I think needs to be done and is being done by the government is that you need redistribution 
uh, not linked to production. You need redistribution. And I think through the food subsidy program, that that is taking care of the bottom uh, 50%, 60% of the population. So for them, it's quite a significant bit of support. Um, and, um, and that is what I think has led to the fact that there is, uh, in, at least according to a study, forthcoming study, that there is uh, in 2019, 20, and 2021, mm -hmm. uh, poverty in India did not go up and indeed uh, might have declined. So this is because of the redistribution policies of the government, particularly through the food sector, which as you know, for the bottom 30, 40% accounts for something like 55 or 60% of total consumption. So um, I think, you know, uh, in terms of, we'll have to wait and see, we cannot have uh, for each, as I said, this has happened for two years, uh, stop gap policies don't work. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, and tourism is a sector being affected around the world, services sector being affected around the world. Um, technology is also changing. Right now, I, you know, it's a economy it has its problems like everywhere else in the world, but it is on a very significant improving trend. Sure. We should take a solace from that. Uh, everybody's in the same boat but we are somewhat more above water than most countries are. And in terms of people uh, and the poor, where I account the poor in terms of the bottom 50, 60%, that I think the income support programs through the food, the Narega, et cetera, uh, are really helping out. So, uh, you know, to come up with, the, as you probably know, come up with specific policies. Once you bring in policies, it becomes very hard to take them out. So therefore, yeah. we shouldn't have uh, specific policies for a particular time period. Um, we should have policies that are sort of successful over the medium term. And uh, as I said earlier, PLI was considered to be not a policy that would work over the medium term. I'm very pleased with whatever input I've got uh, on the success of the PLI. Sir, I would love to hear from you then uh, by way of advice to those uh, you know, entrepreneurs who are watching today's interview. What are those sectors, what are those industries that you think are going to be creating the jobs of the future? What would you want for them to watch out for? That's a tough one in terms of where the Education has always helped in terms of jobs, even though your wage may go down, or relative wage, sorry, let me emphasize, may go down. Um, and, uh, you know, it is a, are we going to get back to uh, more or less what we had before? We know, for example, Zoom and technology, um, artificial intelligence, et cetera. But, you know, the rest of the world is there. Um, and climate is one area where I would think any policy, any manufacturing, et cetera, on climate change, um, solar, you know, you name it, is going to be quite uh, successful. Uh, there's a lot of support, international support for any the uh, carbon mitigation policies and there will be continue to be. So that is, and that's in manufacturing. Um, so I think that's the one sector I would say, uh, we know in terms of automobiles that electric vehicles are going to be the thing. We are already moving in that direction. Uh, anything related to the electric vehicles rather than the old passenger vehicle old uh, gasoline driven vehicles is another area. So that's the switch. It's still automobiles, but it is not the traditional automobile. Um, so those are, but I think as you will see from that, that carbon and climate is a major, major um, uh, focus area uh, for growth in the world. And uh, we are proceeding in that direction, have proceeded in that direction, 
and our performance and climate mitigation, et cetera, is amongst the best in the world. Uh, this is not according to me, this is according to German Watch, which is a, an NGO, which looks at what countries are doing in terms of climate change. Uh, perhaps more can be done, perhaps more will be done, but the climate, I think, is a mega sector um, where expansion is going to take place. And related to that are EVs. On that very optimistic note, thank you so much for your time here, Vishnu. I'm going to slip in a short break on that note back in just a moment. Welcome back. You're with us here in Leaders of Tomorrow. Our icon tonight is Namita Thapar of MQ Pharmaceuticals. and the pharma space, you didn't have, if I can call it the luxury, like the rest of us have of working from home, of seeing how things are changing and then reacting to it. You had to react to it as it was taking place. What was that process like for you, both as a leader and also as someone in the pharma space? You know, when we talk about healthcare in our country, we tend to restrict it to metros and the real India lives in the interiors. And what has been absolutely terrible to see is that access and affordability is still an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that pharma needs to uh, expedite, needs to take to the next level, and we're again all committed to it, is technology. Mm -hmm. Because technology is one thing, Sunanda, that can really help drive healthcare at a grassroots level. In our country, awareness, diagnosis, detection, if I throw some of the numbers out there, they're shocking. Um, and I think this is something that technology can help to a large extent. Um, mm -hmm. Our doctor to bed ratio, doctor, you know, bed to patient ratio, doctor to patient ratio. When you compare these numbers to even the lower tier at the global level, we are far, far behind. So some of these issues are where pharma is spending a lot of their time in talking to the government, to the policy makers, because our role is to make sure the awareness, the diagnosis, the detection reaches the interiors. Technology can expedite this. The right momentum is given to medical infrastructure, medical colleges, where all these ratios improve for the better. Um, and a lot of policy making and a lot of public and private partnership will be needed to take healthcare in India to the next level. So that is one area I wanted to touch upon because that is something I'm actively working. I'm on the Niti IO committee as well. And we're actively uh, preparing a lot of policy papers around that. The second area is women's health. Um, you know, being a woman leader, one of the things that always uh, pains me the most is when World Economic Forum did a survey on women's health um, on one. 56 countries, India ranked 155, which is bottom two. How can we okay? How can we be okay with these statistics, right? And then when MCure did its first of its kind survey on women's health, we found that two thirds women we surveyed, and this is top tier metro educated working women, don't want to talk about health issues because they think it's a taboo and they'll be judged for it. And there's a social stigma. They don't go for their annual checkups. So that explains why we are 155 out of 156. Um, so all across the board, uh, Sunanda, there's a lot of work that pharma companies need to do uh, to really make sure that at a healthcare level, India is where it deserves to be. One of the many hats that you wear, which is that of an investor. I'm curious as to what you look for in a company that you're looking at investing in. Are these necessarily women-owned, funded, led businesses? Because we all know the statistics as far as funding for, uh, you know, women entrepreneur-led and women-founded led businesses are concerned. Single digits, less than 5% is what is going into such businesses. Uh, would you perhaps specifically look at that? How can that, you know, how can that discrepancy really be corrected? 
That's a great question, Sunanda, and one of my favorite questions because um, most people don't know the shocking statistic that uh, when Harvard Business Review came up with a uh, an article a year back, um, 2.3% of women-led companies globally get funded. I mean, that's just a terrible statistic, right? We make up half the world and 2.3% of companies get funded. Uh, that needs to change. Yeah. Um, even when you see the workforce participation, we spoke earlier, it's gone from 37% to 27% pre-COVID to 20% right now. We seem to be regressing as a country where women labor participation is concerned. I mean, how can we be okay with these numbers? So obviously I have a soft spot uh, for women when uh, very, very bright women uh, pitch to me, um, you know, sometimes I take decisions from my heart and not necessarily from my head. Uh, but that aside, when you ask me what are the metrics I look at um, when a founder pitches to me, then I'd say overall three uh, broader areas that I look at. So the first thing I look at is, are they trying to solve a real problem? Because uh, I'm very passionate about impact. It has to solve a problem. It has to solve a large problem and not a niche problem. So that is the thing that excites me most. That are they out there to solve a big problem? Um, the second point that I look at is the founder. I have to see that fire in the belly. Um, and you know, I'm pretty intuitive. So I sense it in their body language. I see it in their eyes. I have to see that passion. I have to see that hunger. I have to see that fire in their belly um, and that competency. Um, the thing that irks me the most is when I ask basic questions on gross margin and competition and they struggle, right? They have to know their business and they have to have the pulse of their business. So that's a competency part I'm talking about and not just a pedigree or a degree. Okay. Um, so the founder is very important. I have to uh, say that I'm going to have a blast working with this founder. It's going to be a fun journey. Um, the third thing that I look at is, am I going to be able to add value? Am I excited about the product and the business? Can I relate to the product and the business? Because I don't believe that an investor should just be a passive investor. Unless I can give my time, my mentoring, my expertise, my networks, if I'm not able to give this to the founder, that's not fair to the founder either. So, you know, when um, uh, areas come where I have the expertise, I have the networks, I get excited and so I can give the time. Uh, those are the sectors that um, um, I look at in terms of investing. I want to talk about our response. And by our, I mean our response as a country and also on the part of the government to the COVID crisis and whether we've really learned enough from the first and the second wave to be able to bring that into the third wave. And I'd love to get your thoughts, Namita. First and foremost, there's been a lot of criticism, of course, on the pricing of the drugs which are available in the market. I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Should a country like India ensure that these drugs are available much cheaper, one, two, uh, you know, on the part of industry, uh, Companies which are providing these vaccines and these medicines in the market are, of course, saying there has to be some profit in terms of the medicines that they are providing. Uh, how, you know, on what side of the debate are you? Is it, is it a fair question to ask you? I think it's a fair question because definitely this is a country that's a developing world with a lot of people below the poverty line. So it's a fair question. But I'd like to say that Indian pharma has definitely been at the forefront of not just making sure that there's no shortage of essential medicines, okay. but making sure that a lot of these essential medicines, we kept bringing down the prices. Um, you know, Remdesivir, a lot of products, uh, if you saw, we were very proactive in bringing down the prices and, and so just not making sure that they were available, but also making sure that they were affordable and accessible. Um, so I'm on my part, you know, my personal opinion, uh, very proud of the way Indian Pharma has reacted to the COVID situation. Um, when we talk about the third wave, I think we've all learned the right lessons that uh, livelihoods are important. Lives are important, but livelihoods are important. Okay. Um, so I think um, what we are doing in terms of a more rational approach, not having a very stringent lockdown, but rather a more uh, rational approach to this third wave will definitely help the economy and will definitely help in reducing the paranoia, which is not needed given the amount of data and given the amount of um, learning that our uh, medical infrastructure have after 18 months of being through this. Uh, very quickly, I just want to talk about, uh, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Chinese 
uh, and China's pharma industry data that I have shows it's likely to become nearly $573 billion by 2022. India, of course, we're a, a, we're a large base as far as uh, generic medicines are concerned. But uh, as more and more innovation is taking place in countries that are closest to us, and of course, in countries like the US, etc., how can we and your advice really for entrepreneurs who are in the pharma space, how can we ensure that we are maintaining the lead that we have? We are maintaining the lead and, you know, I'm part of a lot of pharma associations yeah. where we meet very regularly to discuss exactly what you're saying. That how can we spur innovation? How can we keep up the momentum? And I can assure you on behalf of all the pharma owners that they're very committed to investing in R&D. They're very committed to investing in, um, you know, not just the run of the mill products, but very complex technically difficult to make products. And like you said, we have a lead for a reason. And I can assure you that we are committed to making those investments that will ensure that we continue that lead, not just within India, but at a, at a global level. All right, Namita, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, Sunanda. Pleasure is entirely mine. That's all we have the time for tonight. If you have any feedback for us, do let us know. Our contact details on your screens as we speak. Thank you for watching. Have a good night. Thank you.